Hi, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with journalist and author Monica Guzman to discuss her new book, I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. Monica is the director of digital and storytelling at Braver Angels, a nonprofit working to depolarize America, and is the host of the Crosscut interview series, Northwest Newsmakers. I am fascinated with the topic of effective conversations, so I loved exploring the ideas in Monica's book. Her book couldn't be released at a better time, given the degree of polarization occurring in the United States today. This episode was recorded prior to the actual overturning of Roe v. Wade, but after the leak that suggested the court's immediate intentions. Amongst the many lessons I took away from our conversation is the importance of curiosity and humility in political discourse. It is all too common today for opinionated people to view conversations as an opportunity to tell others what they know, rather than an opportunity to learn something or hear a new perspective. And while Monica points out that there are times for judgment versus curiosity, it seems as though our default position should be to ask questions and practice empathy regardless of how extreme we may find the views of the opposing side. Personally, I feel it's intellectually lazy to categorize someone as having views that are just plain stupid or misinformed. I believe this is true even when we are almost certain that the other side is wrong. Concluding that your views are obviously on the right side of the moral ledger is so easy and tempting, but ultimately leads to rigid thinking and lack of growth. It takes a lot of self-control to practice this level of curiosity, but as someone who formerly thought they were right about everything, I can safely say this mindset shift is worth it. Monica's empathy and desire to build bridges was quite apparent in our talk and her personal stories added some great context to the principles we discussed. She emphasized prioritizing relationships with others over the goal of winning arguments, and details the consequences of developing beliefs in echo chambers that lack viewpoint diversity. Perhaps my favorite quote from her book is, whoever is underrepresented in your life will be overrepresented in your imagination. Instead of people, you'll see monsters, end quote. If you've experienced any sort of frustration while talking about hot-button issues with your friends and family, you will definitely appreciate the insights that Monica had to share. Enjoy. All right, I am here with Monica Guzman. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so Monica is the author of a new book called uh, I Never Thought of It That Way. Uh, the book uh, focuses on the ideas of curiosity and wonder and how those feelings can lead to more effective conversations. Uh, it's a super interesting book. Uh, I, I particularly like the topic of curiosity. Uh, curiosity uh, inspired the name of this podcast. Why do we do that? Uh, it's it's uh, an interest of mine, trying to be more curious, ask better questions. Uh, so, Monica, what inspired you to write this book? So two main threads. One is that I've been a journalist my whole life, and I take very seriously the mission to help people understand each other. Sometime in the last several years, I started to notice that continuing to tell stories as well as I could and as illuminating of, you know, into people's perspectives as I could, didn't seem to really be helping that many people understand each other because of this brokenness and fracturing that exists in our communication landscape and in our relationships. And it was just making everything so much harder to communicate and get across. So I knew that was a problem that I probably wanted to address if that was really my mission. Uh, and then my parents 
my parents and I are very politically divided. We're Mexican immigrants. They voted for Trump both times very enthusiastically. I did not. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I was uh, I was in the liberal camp and still am. And that led to some really heated exchanges and, you know, a lot of opportunities to, to fly off uh, the relationship that we have. But we didn't. We ended up managing to find ways to talk about it all and even the stuff that really confounded and enraged us about the other person's perspective and and get to a point of understanding. So I know it's possible. I know it's hard, but I think that the difficulty is more psychological than actual. And that's because curiosity is just a really, really powerful tool. Yeah, the uh, the there's a long thread throughout the book. Uh, where you kind of go back and talk about your relationship with your parents. I'm sure that's that's one of the more common dynamics, at least, you know, people under the age of of 30 or, or even under the age of 40 are probably experiencing where there's uh, polarization between within the family, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we're definitely going to talk more about polarization. Uh, let's let's first talk about uh, the 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 beginning of the book where you start talking about, patterns of behavior that can contribute to communicating less effectively. So you, you kind of mentioned how we choose who we interact with and uh, how we think differently about, about some people versus others. Um, what are some of these behaviors that, that make it difficult to communicate effectively? Yeah. So I talk about at the beginning of the book, the SOS, the, the call for help, sorting, othering, and siloing. These are very natural human tendencies that lumped all together in a time of lots of stress and anxiety, lots of change and lots of fear uh, lead us to where we are in this fractured place. So sorting is wanting to be around people who are like you. It's uh, something that gets more intense when people feel anxious. We want, we don't want to make our lives, our already stressed out lives more stressful by being around people who are going to challenge us at every corner. That doesn't feel right. We'd rather be around people who are like us. Okay. And then othering is the, what we do when we just make distance between ourselves and people we deem different. And the social science research behind it shows that the differences don't even have to be that meaningful for us to discriminate in really small ways, you know, against the people we deem different. Uh, And then finally, siloing is is all about the stories we hear and don't hear. It's about the thoughts that stimulate our thoughts or challenge our thoughts and the ones that don't even come anywhere close because we're not around them. Uh, So yeah, it's almost like, you know, the the trenches we dig and they grow deeper and deeper and deeper and it becomes really hard to hear in any accurate way uh, the stories or the perspectives of people who are just not like us, who are very different. So yeah, so, so so those three categories, the sorting, the othering, and the siloing, these are the behaviors that have led us to where we are. You know, this place of this place of fracturing, it's not it's not all lost, but but these these trends are continuing. Um, they're not they're not by themselves getting better. So our only choice as individuals, if we want to see the world clearly at all, is to take matters into our own hands and to hack around. Uh, these defaults, these factory settings of the world around us by going and getting curious about people who are different from us with the people who are different from us. Yeah. Now, do you ever, specifically with this idea of othering, right, that um, we oftentimes uh, will be less, well, we might, we have a tendency to, to look at others in what we would call out groups as, as, as negative. Like uh, we, sometimes we demonize people that are, that are on the other side. Um, And we often, we often will judge their motives before we even get into talking about the content of their beliefs, right? You know, you're not, you're not being authentic or you're hateful, right? Um, I'm curious, do you ever think that it's, it's a pro- do you ever think it's appropriate to judge others' motives? So for example, like sometimes people say one thing and they actually are driving at something else. So as an example, if you take um, smoking regulations, right? When, when it was you know, 30, 40 years ago, I guess, when smoking was more acceptable, smoking cigarettes, that is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and 
there was a trend to re, you know reduce the amount of smoking in public places. So they said, you know, if it was in restaurants, well, now there's a smoking section. And then when there was a smoking section, then it was, well, now you need to go outside. And when it was go outside, then it was, well, you got to go outside, but then you have to go down the street a little bit. You can't smoke within 25 feet of the building. Mm -hmm. And at the time, smokers were willing to do that because they thought it was just about it. They thought it was just about the health hazards to non-smokers, mm -hmm. but it, it, it sort of morphed into like, well, we don't, we, we just don't want you smoking, right? Like mm -hmm. there are currently laws that will that are trying, you know, sort of in the process where they don't even want you to smoke in your car or at your own home, right? And it almost feels as though there's a discrepancy between what they're trying to do and what their mm -hmm. actual goals are. So do you, do you actually feel that, 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 that judging motives or, or being skeptical of others uh, in terms of their mm -hmm. motives is, is helpful? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh so curiosity and judgment are like oil and water. They don't mix. When you are truly curious, you can't, you're not really truly judgmental. You, you are, you are, you are in um, intake mode. You're learning, you're learning, you're gathering information. Right? When you're judgmental, it's really hard to be curious uh, because you've, you've made up your mind. And so everything in your, in your head is taking shape around the judgments that you're making. So, but both of them are valuable. The, the thing is about cart before the horse. A lot of times, too often in this world, we're making the judgments well before we put curiosity to work to get us information about what we're missing, about someone else's perspective. So judgment in and of itself is good. It's just too often reckless today. We, we judge before we understand and we don't understand because we've never bothered to really get curious. We just kind of accept whatever answers are coming at us from our silos or from some thought piece on the internet that feels right. And so we just believe it <laughs> instead right. of being like, no, nah, you're probably missing a lot. So, so yeah, I think that judgment is good. Critique is very important. You know, we're not going to be a successful um, democratic Republic, right. In the, in the ideals that we've, we've held about how we let ideas test ideas. If we don't let them actually challenge each other, um, the thing is, there has to be enough of a foundation of trust that we're doing it for the right reasons. And uh, too often people won't even really share their true perspectives with someone on the other side because they just feel condescended to, they feel raged at, they think that it's just all, all at a loss, they think it's going to be psychologically damaging or harmful. There's so many reasons we don't even want to allow friction. Uh, on, on our thinking. And so we'll skip right to judgment. We'll just skip right to judgment because why bother with the other stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what do you think it takes to build curiosity? Uh, it, it, it seems because I, I, the more I think about curiosity, the more pessimistic I get that, that, that some, that it's, it's, highly predetermined that that curiosity is something that is is something that that occurs or is determined through your upbringing and to a certain extent the situation mm. um it's kind of like like i think of it as like being punctual it's like you need to be more punctual mm. and 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 my gut tells me that it seems extremely difficult to get someone to care about something they don't care about Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. so what does it take to, uh, for a society to encourage or build curiosity in others and, mm -hmm. and, and have less judgment? Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to what you just said. You know, it's difficult to get someone to care about something they don't care about. And one, one of the most reliable uh, vehicles is what if they care about you? If they care about you they may care about what you care about because they care about you. That's why relationship is so important and trust is so important when it comes to curiosity. So I may not care about the issue that my neighbor uh, is advocating for, but if I care about my neighbor, that's an on-ramp to caring about the issue that they, that matters to them. So that, that really is the connection between relationship and trust and curiosity. Yeah. I, I, I like how you couch that in terms of relationships. I, I, I know several times since Trump was uh, elected, having conversations about uh, how relationships are more important than political views. Mm. 
And I didn't think that was controversial. Like, mm. I, I didn't think that was a controversial view. And then I started noticing that, yeah. you know, the, the common argument, I guess, would be, well, if you, well, okay, so let's, let's use a, a, a specific example. Roe versus Wade is in the news. Right. It's the perfect example for these kind of, this polarization. As, so, as soon as that news came out, like, I knew, ex I knew exactly what was going to happen, that you would see mm -hmm. social media posts of people just sort of declaring their view like this is this is my opinion it, it was almost inevitable mm -hmm. um and yeah it, it, it it's i don't know where the relationship like what is so controversial about caring about that relationship yeah yeah i i you know it, it's it's bizarre it um is. Is, is is there um i mean when you hear sort of it, people say to something to the effect of, well, if you did care about me, you would believe this or you would support this. Mm -hmm. um, what are your, what are your reactions to those types of comments? Mm. Yeah. I mean that, yeah, that is tricky. If you did care about me, then you would support this thing that I think is so important. I mean, we kind of know that that doesn't work, right? Because many of us know a lot of people who care about a lot of things. And we can't all care about all the things that they all care about the same way that they do. It right. just doesn't add up. Like logically, we kind of know that that doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I, I, I was a little stunned when you brought up this question because just very recently, someone that I know very well was in basically that exact situation where someone very close to him said, you know, this is proof that you don't care because you don't care about this. I'm seeing that as proof. And it really hurt him. You know, and then they ended up having to like patch things up a little bit later. There was a phone call, you know, this happened in a group text, but there was a phone call where it was like, Hey, I, I was out of line. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. But that is the temptation, isn't it? That's the temptation to conflate, you know, our relationship with, well, but if you don't, if you don't see things the way I do, how can I believe that you care about me? Because mm -hmm. this matters to me that much, you know, but again, when we hold our, when we hold each other to that level. It, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. We have to know that that can't quite be right. Um, this also makes me think of, you know, deeper, deeper, tougher things. A, a good friend of mine is, um, is queer and, you know, came out to her um, very religious parents 20 years ago and they didn't really accept her. And it was really hard, obviously, to be her at that, at that point. 20 years later, her father flew across the country to be part of her 40th birthday. And she's talked to me about how it took 20 years um, to her, for her to appreciate something that she had seen very differently in the past that, you know, her father, her, her father did not accept her in the way she needed to be accepted for a long time but she didn't burn the relationship. She didn't burn the bridge to her father. She, she let it stand as painful as it could be. She let it stand. And now she's looking back and she's going, oh my gosh, like all that pain that they went through trying to reconcile, how can I be a good, you know, member of my religion and also embrace and love my daughter who is doing things that are against this particular brand of my religion. She, she like has sort of more empathy now for that struggle. And she sees the way she, she told me about it, it's like, it's like her parents had to kind of break themselves and remake themselves and go through this whole transformation that took a long time to yeah, be able I, to feel like they could be good in their religion and accept their daughter. And so now she sees that as sort of like a work of love on their, on their part, even though it was so pain, it was painful non-acceptance for so long. Right. Right. I, and I like how you brought up empathy. Um, I, I think that, I mean, it seems to me that especially when it comes to these sort of um, these, well, again, abortion being in the news, that you see both sides uh, focusing on arguments and yelling, right? That, like, it, it's, it's very similar, the amount of fervor on each side, mm, yep. but I mean, you could there there are ways to be empathetic 
on both sides. You can be, you, you can express, you know, pro-choice beliefs mm. uh, while being empathetic to, while being empathetic to a, a, a fundamental religious, a fundamentalist mm -hmm. religious person who is more concerned about, or has, has a, a sort of builds their belief system around protecting uh, a fetus. And you can also be pro-life and express empathy about a woman who wants to make a medical choice. Mm -hmm. But we don't, for some reason, we're we, we don't, we, we lose this detachment. Where, mm -hmm. where do you think we go wrong? Why do you think it's so hard to be empathetic with each other? Is, is there mm -hmm. something, is there something in the water? Is it, is it just the current <laughs> political climate? Yeah. I mean, well, there's many ways to answer that question. W one thing that I'll say is that we're not actually that bad at it. It's just that we don't share the case studies and the instances where we're good at it. We don't, we don't share it. And so we think it doesn't happen, but to give you a perfect example, uh, because of, you know, writing my book and, and the impact it's having, and I'm hearing from a lot of people, I ended up getting connected with someone who ran into my work and said, Hey, I, uh, started a group with my cousins who are scattered across the country. And we started having these monthly meetings over Zoom where we talk about the hard things, the really hard things that we disagree on. She's got, you know, she's liberal herself. Um, one of her cousins is a former uh, state rep in the state of Michigan and a fundamentalist Christian conservative along with his wife. And then they have, you know, his son is also conservative and, and, and the, um, Susan's niece is like, you know, liberal like her. And then there's the sister. Anyway, they invited me to join their monthly meeting yesterday mm -hmm. and they were talking about Roe v. Wade and they had a two hour conversation. That was exactly what you're saying, where, I mean, they were passionate. They were really passionate. Right. And the folks more conservative, there's also a woman who's Catholic conservative and then someone who's more Christian conservative, but both of them really insisting on, you know, the, 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 the interpretation of the values that they see that really push toward, no, you, you gotta, you gotta restrict abortion as much as you possibly can. Right. And then, and then on the other hand, the, the, the people who are more liberal on this issue, making an extraordinary case for, you know, the other side of that. And, and I, I, toward the end, you know, I had to tell them like, wow, thank you so much for letting me witness that. It was just really clear the, the love and respect you have for each other, even though, they absolutely yelled. I mean, it got heated, but every now and then someone would crack an inside joke, you know, mm -hmm. within the family and then tensions would ease. Right. And they could get right back to the work of trying to understand. And so they all ended by saying, this was awesome. You know, I'm grateful yeah. for this. So I just want to make that point that like, people are doing this. It's just, you can't do it on Twitter. You can't, yeah. you can't, you know, you have to do it where, where there's containment enough to allow for candor. Um, and it's not, as I said, I think I said this in the beginning, but 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 people people think this is really 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 technically difficult. It's psychologically difficult and technically easy. Interesting. Yeah, that was. Uh, I I I was thinking the same thing that we sort of have gotten to the point where we've substituted face to face conversation with um, with more with a combination of texting and online communication and. Uh, public forums, like posting to a, a Facebook feed or something like that. And it's, it's not so much that like we, we can't articulate ourselves, but we, we ignore or just completely miss the boat on how different it is when you're posting to Facebook versus talking in person. And, uh, you know, every, I have friends that on Facebook are politically extreme, mm -hmm. but in person, they are, I mean, it is a different human being mm -hmm. and it makes it, and it, and it, and it is terrifying because, <laughs> because so many people develop their perceptions of where the country's at based on, well, this is, you know, the stream of, of nonsense that's right. going on, on, on social media. Right. Uh, do you have any other thoughts about how technology is making <laughs> this, this conversation more, more difficult? Yes. Yes, I do. I have many thoughts. About this. <laughs> I was a tech journalist for many years. And back in, you know, 2009, 10, 11, I was singing the praises of all these platforms because of what they were allowing us to do and yeah. see and how they, how we could connect. And it was beautiful. And a lot of it still is beautiful. I think what we've realized is it's all, it's again, it's like psycho the psychology, you know, it was all happening too fast back then for us to understand the psychology 
but, um, but yeah, I know, I know several people who are just like you were saying where on Facebook, it, what they appear to think and find important based on their Facebook posts is very different than what they appear to think and find important if you interact with them in person. And I think we're still very early, like embarrassingly early on understanding the difference. But, but I think there's, I'm not a psychologist, so please don't believe anything I'm about to say. <laughs> but just, just anecdotally observing myself and, and you know, observing these platforms as, as I've been able to, I think there is something about when you are in these spaces, there's, there's something more id-like that comes up it within you. And I think that your anxieties hold a bit more sway over your thinking. And you don't have a lot checking you because you're in a context of constant comparison. I don't think we realize that, but like we're surrounded by how many likes did my photo get? How many likes did their photo get? Oh my gosh, I'm envious of that person's journey. They work on the same thing I work on, but look at how, look at where they were. Oh my God, they were at this conference, you know? And then it's like, yeah. oh, and let me think about Roe v. Wade. Ah. Yeah. And we're ah. also kind of, <laughs> we're also yeah. kind of substituting, uh, uh, forms of of displaying competence i mean competence is one of these fundamental human motives we we need others to see us as competent but just going on social media and and shouting to the rooftops or uh, you know it's uh, the you know the term virtue signaling has become mm, yeah. a, a big a big thing um mm -hmm. i have mixed feelings about it um how so in terms of uh digital communication. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sort of, uh, have you come across any sort of practical ideas that can help with digital communication? I know in the book, you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about context uh, and, and, and being aware that, that sending somebody a message, uh, a, a, a private message online or a public message online is a completely different context than having a, a discussion. Right. So I talk about five conditions for good conversations. And before you broach uh, what might be a difficult divisive topic to check where the levels are on each of these five conditions. So it's time. Do you and the other person actually have the time to go into whatever? Like, don't bring up a really tough topic when you're out the door. Um, uh, attention. Do you actually know that you have each other's attention? So, you know, I always get a laugh at live events when I talk about you know, that thing that happens on a Zoom call where you're looking at someone else and suddenly their face gets brighter because they have they have navigated to a different tab on their browser that is brighter. And so you can tell like, wow, you're literally reading the internet while you're talking to me. Like how much of your attention is actually on me if you are going off and doing things with the other 30% of your attention? Um, parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y. It's like, are you actually on equal playing I, I, are you on, a, on an equal playing field uh, on the platform that you're on, right? So if I'm the TikTok author and you're the TikTok commenter, one of us can ban the other, hide the other, delete the other, right? But, but yeah, it's not an equal playing field. Then there's containment, which I think is the most important for what we're talking about. What, to what degree is your conversation actually contained to the people having the conversation? On social media, there's this like mass audience bananas thing that we do where we share stuff to a complete mass audience and we don't witness the listening. We don't see how they're listening. And, and like, imagine this, this is almost terrifying, right? Like you put something on Facebook that's a little controversial and you don't think about it, but it's like, there's going to be anywhere from, you know, a few to hundreds of people who see that. And then some of them are going to be like this, mm -hmm. you know, Ugh. and you have no idea who, who's doing that. They're not going to hit like, <laughs> you know, yeah. so we don't witness listening. And so we end up, of course, performing because we know it's a panopticon. Like we're going to perform our views on social media to this invisible mass audience instead of explore curiously what our views actually are. And then finally, embodiment. That's the last one. And that's how much of the of the full complement of communication tools that every human being or most human beings are assigned. Are you actually bringing into this? Right. And I think that that is also just a point of a lot of absurdity where people walk into an extremely big job with a tiny little toolkit. Here's some words and some emojis. Let's go. Yeah. Instead of no, like, what about my tone, my gestures, my, you can tell that I care about something. Like, what about that? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's wild to me that we have so many of these exchanges in places that were completely limited 
and, and, and again, we just don't talk about it. We don't think about it. It's fine. It's not fine. <laughs> it's not right. Fine. Right. Yeah. I, uh, the, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, sort of the negatively skewed comments, uh, I always go back to this, this idea that, um, that no one, no one has really ever ch changed their mind by being told they're stupid. And you, you yeah. have a, you have a similar, you have a similar, similar quote in the, in the, in the book, but, um, it, it, it somewhat baffles me that, um, that, that individuals would, would rather sort of, I guess, vent than, mm. than, than change minds. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of that. It's, um, we've built up a lot of resentment, you know, I think that the, uh, there's a lot of these negative and some, somewhat sort of beautiful, understandable emotions going on right now, like confoundedness. There's a lot of confoundedness. How could people do this? It feels like a crazy time. How can people do this, right? And so that becomes very easy to, to generate resentments, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I resent all these other people who, who are making my world so much more stressful than, it, than, than I want it to be. Uh, and so, yeah, you're going to bring those resentments out. Um, and it's going to get ahead of, of curiosity, you know, because it's like you, you just feel like you already know everything you need to know to know that these other people are dumb or terrible. Mm -hmm. But the truth is you don't. You, you don't. You cannot be certain of that. You shouldn't be certain of that if you actually want to have a society can go away at us. Actually, they cannot believe that. It is extraordinarily counterproductive for the reason you mentioned. Because nobody changed their mind by being told they're stupid. Nobody changed their mind by being told they're crazy. Nobody changed their mind by being told they're evil. And these are the three things that we keep telling each other. That's what's dumb, <laughs> you know? Right. <clears throat> We're undermining yeah, the whole project. Yeah. So, so you, spend, um, you spend a great deal of the book sort of dissecting conversation and, and sort of mapping out what makes for effective conversation and going back to what we were just talking about one of those things is 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 asking questions um and how just a subtle shift in how you look at conversations uh and and sort of infusing that curiosity can make for more effective conversations um i i really love this idea i've i've made concerted efforts in the past uh, five to ten years or so to to sort of catch myself in conversations with people and sort of, cause for some reason that default is I know a thing mm. <laughs> and, and uh, it takes a lot of cognitive effort to take a breath and maybe rephrase, you know, uh, uh, instead of saying what you think, ask somebody why they said what they just said. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's an, if, if it's Roe v. Wade, it's, it's like, so, so tell me, you know, tell me if you think there is a line where, where abortion should be illegal. Tell me mm -hmm. why you think that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are some questions that we can take with us uh, or, or how can we embody this sort of a curious question a uh, asking mentality in conversations? Yeah. Um, well, one of my favorite kinds of questions to ask because it is uh it is so much more frequently curious than judgmental is uh, a question about what people's concerns are around something so typically we want to say what do you think well why do you think that wait what about this what about that and then we usually go down that rabbit hole uh and instead you can say what are, what what concerns you most about what's going on with roe v wood and that's a wonderful, a wonderfully curious question because curiosity, we all have different ideas in our minds of what it is, but, but a really like the most functional way to think of what is curious is if it's primarily motivated to close the gap between what you know and what you want to know. So any question that undermines its own ability to actually do that is not a curious question. Um, what ultimately concerns you about Roe v. Wade gets a lot of interesting information from someone. Um, mm -hmm. it's not judgmental. Everyone's concerned by something, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you concerned about? Well, there's this and that and the other thing. And then what's the follow-up question? The best follow-up question to that is what else are you concerned about? So we tend to, you know, curiosity, if we want to be intentional about it, we're still impatient to share our opinion. 
were still impatient to jump in. And one of the most beautiful, beautifully curious things that we can do is to continue to listen, continue to listen. And every time that I've done the follow-up question, what else are you concerned with? There will be more. Like many of us spend, spend a little bit of energy wondering when we have said too much. You know, if we, if we want to connect with the other person, you know, many of us have that little radar kind of in our head. Like I've said too much, I should stop. I shouldn't say, say more. But then when somebody goes, no, I want to hear more. Oh, that's a lovely thing to say. It's mm-hmm. a lovely thing to hear. You go, really? Oh, okay. Let me dig a little deeper. Well, I'm also worried about this or that and the other thing. Okay. Wow. You know? And so then when you've spread the table, you've set the table with like a feast of things to get curious about all these concerns. Wow. Now, now you're, wow. You know, now, now you're, you're really going to be there for a good while learning. So what, what do you, what would you say to someone who, who would reply to that and say, I'm just not interested, you know, Mm. I'm just not interested in hearing about that. I'm just not interested in hearing about why someone wants to limit women's rights and, and make, uh, abortion illegal Mm -hmm. what so because it seems like such a strong compulsion that Mm -hmm. that especially if it's baked if you think that uh, you're on the right side of morality then why are you being curious right yeah and i mean what i would say to that is you can't fake curiosity in a conversation so you shouldn't even try and if if you really don't think if it's going to be just a painful like you're going to, you're going to just sit here with your arms crossed the whole time, even if, you know, it's not physical, but mental don't, you know, don't do it. But what I would say to that person is if you want to work on this issue, if you, if you are really sure that you are on the right side of this issue and you want to fight, um, you are cheating yourself out of a, a good understanding of the best strategies to influence the world. If you don't understand how the other side sees it. You know, and then that person says, I understand just fine. And then I would ask, okay, how many people on the other side have you sat down and really explored their perspective with, right? And if they say quite a few, I'd be like, oh, okay, there's no problem here. We're good. You know, <laughs> I think you're, that's great. But, you know, they'll say, well, I don't know. I've, I've, I haven't, I haven't talked to them because they're terrible and it's painful and I don't want to go. And I'm like, okay, well, there's other things to work on there, you know, because this is a psychologically differently difficult thing for everybody. But again, I would begin with, but if you don't approach the people themselves generously, you do not understand this issue the way you think you do. You don't, or at least you won't understand it well enough to make a difference in it. You'll understand it well enough to hold up a sign and be part of the script that repeats itself decade after decade. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that can feel real good. But I mean, this is where I'm going to push real hard. It's like, there's a reason that these wicked issues don't get resolved for all time, right? And mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's partly because they kind of can't, but it's also because we get so emotional about it and, and understandably for very good reasons that we just don't want to approach each other. And so we can't get creative. When we're this afraid and suspicious, we can't be creative. It's like literally mm-hmm. opposite sides of the same thing. So here's, here's the thing though, because it's not the end of the road, right? If if you are for whatever reason in a place of like, I am not interested, I can't, I can't do it, I don't wanna do it, cool. You don't have to, the only way to get curious is not in a conversation with another person. What you can still do is, you know, let's say that it's this Roe v. Wade example. You, you come across an article on the internet that is written by someone who, who is on the other side of your issue for whatever reason. You recognize that it comes from a reputable enough source, okay? And then you click on it. And you read that article asking yourself two questions. What is the deep down honest concern that this person is expressing that has led to their take on this issue? And then you ask, what is the strongest argument on the side of this? And if you read that article and you come out with the same thing, then you haven't really read it. You haven't like necessarily opened your mind to like, what is this person really saying? They're telling a unique story. Try to find it, try to find it. So you can get curious without having to approach another person, without putting yourself into that level of vulnerable risk and exposure, which I know scares a lot of people. Just do it. Wow, everyone is saying so much. There's bajillions and trillions of words on the internet of people trying to explain themselves. So, so go and read them generously 
mm-hmm. you know, and that is actually, that's a step toward curiosity. That is enough. That's great. Right. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, on the same, on the same, uh, a similar note, um, another, another sort of ob- objection to being curious that I've seen uh, is this idea of s- s- some, some people on the far left and far right uh, might see asking questions as an attack. It's this new thing. Mm. I, it's, it's, it makes me very uncomfortable because I'm, because I've spent so much Mm. time trying to ask more questions. And now this sort of idea is popping up more and more often. Um, uh, what would you say to someone that feels that, for example, we need to, uh, protect marginalized groups by disrupting and censoring speech Mm. that, that could be, that could be harmful. Mm-hmm. What, how do we address that, that concern? Yeah. I mean, first with, by acknowledging like empathetically where that concern is coming from, um, the level of fear and anxiety is very, very high. Uh, you know, it's as high as it's been in my lifetime in terms of how, how secure people feel uh, in many cases, just being who they are. You know, my, my friends who are queer, who are black, like I'm Latina, uh, whatever, just, There's a lot of invitations to feel insecure because of who you are based on the political winds that are blowing. Right. So, so that's, that's just one thing. It's like, well, (laughs) yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be harder uh, for some people to see their way to this at all. um, And to think that it can be any good at all. That said, I would rather live in a culture where I would rather live in a culture where we we find ways to be able to hear each other no matter what we're saying and have trust that the best ideas really are going to win than I would uh, to live in a culture where we have to keep building walls up to protect each other. So, So it's like the difference between the question, you know, how do we protect... How do we protect people from those who do not see them? And the question, how do we build a world where everyone can be seen? Mm -hmm. And I think the better question to ask is the second one. Because if we put ourselves in this path of someone always needs to be protected, so let's work on that. And we have to, you know, silence here and then raise the volume here. And it's it's like a game of whack-a-mole and we, we can do that forever. But, but, I, but I do think, I do believe that we're undermining if we choose that route for too long. And again, I understand it in times of crisis. And I'd say maybe we're in one now, like I get it. But I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay here in this place where we think, no, it, it's, that's, that's really undermining the foundations of our society. Um, if yeah, an I, idea sucks, it sucks. Show it sucks because it does. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I saw. I didn't get a chance to watch all of it, but I saw that you had, did a, a, a talk with Jonathan Rausch, who wrote a book called "Kindly Inquisitors" a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. That was that was um, uh, quite prophetic. Um, and you know, uh, you know, one of the principles in there was that bad ideas need light; otherwise, they fester. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, right. <laughs> it's it's um, it's yeah. it, it is it's kind of I, I mean. I think that you know the, the 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 hard part, of course, is is how much do we how much do we focus on the emotional impact of something that someone says in public, right? Ultimately, this ends up becoming it 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 does end up becoming a free speech issue at some point, right? Mm-hmm. Which yeah, is, it does. You know, do you protect someone even like? Do you, should we expect someone to? deal with the emotional consequences of right. someone who's not very empathetic and kind of an asshole. Yeah. But again, it's sort of, it's what we were saying before about values. Like there's a really good value around security. And if people don't feel a baseline sense of security in their own society, you know, we've got to work on that. Uh, and of course there's this baseline value of freedom of expression that is beautiful. And, and one of the greatest things about this country, right, that we've managed to protect it, that I've been able to be a journalist here without fearing for my life. I'm from Mexico. People kill journalists in Mexico, right? Mm-hmm. So I am, I am aware every day of how lucky I am to, to be here. So that's worth preserving, right? 
but but so but 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 for the same reason it's like people people associate freedom of speech as this like uniquely american thing and it, and it mm-hmm. is and it's in some ways and it's really cool and all right great but so is so is this idea that all people who are very different ought to feel secure in america that's the statue of liberty that's give me your tired your hungry your poor that's uniquely american too and so mm-hmm. what i what i when i look around what i see is really like a a duel between those two things that are both wonderful and so you know what i mean like mm-hmm. it's a beautiful it's a beautiful struggle um because we just learned a lot there's been a lot of like bombs dropped on our psyche recently and it's going to take time to to sift through and, and process everything uh but yeah but i agree with you i mean what we saw to bring up something really truly terrible you know what happened in new york recently with the the shooting in the grocery store and what we know of that of that man who did it i mean when I think of the fractured society, you know, you were saying um, from Jonathan Rauch that if, if we don't give ideas light, what, how did you, what was it that you were saying? Well, I, I think that bad, I, bad ideas need to see the light of day. Otherwise they fester. And, right. They fester. Or, yeah, and so that's yeah. the thing that when, when Rauch wrote this years ago, festering today is a lot worse. Yeah, absolutely. Ideas 100%. festering. It used to be that ideas festering just festered in like someone's heart and they were just like, you know, get consumed by that. It's terrible. Now someone can just go online and find someone else who believes that festering idea and they can fester together. And then it gets just, it's just this cancer that grows and grows and grows. Right. And so, (laughs) Oh, you know, so I, so I look around and I see all these fractured information silos, thousands, millions of them. You know, we think it's just Fox News versus New York Times. No, it's all these walled gardens online of different communities having conversations that no one else is a part of. And we're not allowing a lot of friction to develop between these communities. And we're shutting doors to certain voices here and there. And as if, as if I don't allow them to speak on Facebook, so they're gonna shut up? What? Do you know how people work? (laughs) That's not how people work. You know what that's, I mean? Like that's, those that's, concerns I think that should be the name real. of your next book. Do you, do you know how, do you people, know how work? people work? I mean, they're not going to, this is crazy. Yeah. This is mm-hmm. sheer insanity. Like if people feel, feel resentful and feel like there's a concern that isn't being heard, they're going to find a way to, to be heard. And if it's not by people who can bring, you know, perspectives that complicate and enrich what they're talking about, then it's, it is going to fester really fast in the wrong direction. Right. So right. we're doing yeah, this to well, ourselves, you know, like. Sure. Well, the, uh, the name of the book is, I never thought of it that way. And uh, if anything, it is, it is a, uh, a guide to uh, creating bridges. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. We're out of time. Um, Monica Guzman, thank you so much for being on my show. Thank you for the amazing questions. We, we went to some pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty heated places and I love that. So thank you. For more on Monica, visit moniguzman.com. That's M-O-N-I-G-U-Z. MAN.com. Or visit BraverAngels.org to learn more about her nonprofit, whose mission is to bring Americans together to bridge partisan divide and strengthen our democratic republic. Also, please check out her new book, I Never Thought of It That Way How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times, wherever books are sold. Be sure to follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or Twitter at WDWDTPod. As always, feel free to email me at Why Do We Do That Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question. Why do we do that? Mm-hmm.